slap the WWE logo on something and it's automatically of equal value to the company's more important offerings. Now you and I know that that's a silly notion, but in Vince McMahon's den of iniquities, they usually believe much differently. A look at their pay-per-view calendar reveals, well, that line of thinking, as a bunch of supplementary events have been concocted through the years and given the same price point as your tentpoles like SummerSlam, Survivor Series, Royal Rumble, and Fatal 4-Way. And, well, we know that not all pay-per-views are created equal, WWE branding or not. Now, we usually cover the absolute worst pay-per-views in this series, but today we're going to discuss one that had, well, absolutely no reason to exist. Not only just this singular event itself, but the chronology as a whole, as this turned out to be the second in a series of two. For good reason, as you'll soon see. Oh, and true to the spirit of the series, this show did suck as well. That's a very important qualifier. The 2010 WWE bragging rights is one of the worst shows ever. Brace yourselves, it's time for a history lesson. The WWE pay-per-view calendar began with WrestleMania in 1985, though it wasn't exactly a pay-per-view, it still counts. In the late 80s, WrestleMania was supplemented by three pay-per-views that were intended to visually stimulate the eager eyes of the Federation fan base and also to undercut Jim Crockett Jr.'s attempts at expansion. But that's, that's an unnecessary subplot, really. These, of course, were SummerSlam, Survivor Series and the Royal Rumble. Later, they did add King of the Ring to both properly bridge WrestleMania to SummerSlam and, of course, to give Mabel what he always needed, which was just a big sword, really. In the pay-per-view, arms race of the mid-90s, WWE responded to WCW's rapid expansion by inventing ancillary in-your-house events at, of course, reduced price and quality. By the end of 1997, though, these events became their own three-hour fuller-priced supercards, each one of them eventually taking on a full-time name. These included No Way Out, Backlash, Judgment Day, Fully Loaded, Unforgiven, No Mercy, and Armageddon. For years after the fact, the formula was simple. Raw and SmackDown built over the course of four or five weeks to the next momentous pay-per-view, Lather, rinse, repeat, and profit. Take that, Bischoff. But then it lost its way. With the advent of the brand extension, WWE got into their silly little brains that people would spend $200 a year to watch five SmackDown exclusive pay-per-views. I mean, $200. You can get like two or three really good please pay attention to me tattoos with that money. When WWE expanded their pay-per-view calendar to include a few more brand exclusive events, they quickly came to learn that, well, more was not more at all. By the late aughts, the pre-WWE Network pay-per-view scene was getting pretty stagnant as fans loathed to buy several months worth of rematches and there really wasn't any compelling feuds to sustain interest. So what does WWE do, I hear you ask? Reduce the pay-per-view calendar? No, 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 no. Clearly not a stockholder. What WWE did was they changed the name and themes of the events to cater to gimmick matches. You know, people buy the Royal Rumble to see the Royal Rumble match. They buy King of the Ring for the tournament. And they buy SummerSlam to watch different seasons engage in Equinox-related combat. So WWE figured that specifically labeling pay-per-views with gimmick matches would mean that the more easily impressed would spend money to see them. Now, a few of them have endured for years after the fact, like Hell in a Cell, Money in the Bank, TLC, Elimination Chamber, and Extreme Rules. Others, like the submission-centric Breaking Point, the quadrupular chaos of Fatal 4-Way, and Over the Limit, where wrestlers would argue with the game warden about local fishing laws, all lived short lives. Then, of course, to the ones that never saw the light of day. Here were the never wars. Buried alive, reusing the same grave didn't make sense logistically. Raging Inferno, because that fire marshal's a real wet blanket. Lock up, an all cage match pay-per-view that more than 7,000 people will actually pay to see. <coughs> TNA. Lumberjack Lunacy, featuring the event mascot Lumberjack the Jobber. Blindfold Bonnaroo. This is where the commentators were blindfolded, but Vince will tell them exactly what to say. Get your strap on. Not that type. Get that out your head. This was all leather strap matches. AWA One Night Stand, because Hogan's still not getting the belt. WrestleMania rematches at half the price, which was made redundant by Backlash. No Way Out of NDAs, which was a Vince McMahon special. And Hell in a Smell, because Pachiti remains unchallenged at that event. 
Now, as tragic as it was that we never got to bear witness to those million dollar ideas, what's more tragic is that this event here actually did run through those very same checks. The late great Robin Williams once said that the white powder was God's way of telling you that you'd made too much money. And in that vein, bragging rights was God's way of telling you that you'd run out of ideas for pay-per-views. The concept for bragging rights was simple. It's the one night of the year in which Raw and SmackDown go head to head in their red competition, along with Survivor Series, and the Royal Rumble, and WrestleMania crossover feuds, and those special editions of Raw, and the occasional house show. Don't think about it too much. But yes, bragging rights was all about brand supremacy. Brand supremacy, as you'll know, is extremely important to WWE wrestlers. Whether it's Raw or SmackDown, WWE wrestlers are willing to drop their piddling day-to-day -day grudges in order to take up arms against the cast members of a TV show on another network. Pledging nothing less than total loyalty to the TV show's colours that were randomly selected for them during the course of a 12-hour booking meeting one Thursday in April. Raw wrestlers bleed red, SmackDown wrestlers bleed blue, and they'll continue to to do so until the end of time, or of course, until they're moved to the other show during the draft or the shakeup or, or just a random reason really, just any random reason. When this happens, the brawny brawler that spent years bellowing death to Raw will suddenly just drop that and bellow death to SmackDown without an ounce of hesitation or self-awareness. I mean, that is until they're released in the spring cleaning, in which case it becomes death to WWE. To determine the better brand and to obtain those oh so important bragging rights, a 7 on 7 elimination match was concocted. Now just to illustrate how important and historic this match was, I'm going to get Luke to put up the 14 participants on the screen right now, and I will leave it to you to figure out who was on that team. Ready? And go! There's only 14 of them. Which 7 were on Raw and which 7 were on Smackdown? Did you get it right? Nope. Well, don't feel too bad on that one. The SmackDown vs Raw match is only being used to promote the latest SmackDown vs Raw video game and has no more actual significance than that. It's just like when WWE booked a bunch of stuff to infuriate and frustrate its fan base in the autumn of 2019 and then dropped 2K20. Glitchy booking, glitchy game. Classic synergy. It should be noted that while the 2009 version of Bragging Rights had three different interbrand matches, the 2010 version is relegated to just two. I can only wonder how all the cable systems didn't crash with so many people rushing to order this pay per view all at once. So, with that in mind, let's look at what comprises the rest of this expensive filler. For the third pay per view in a row, we're getting a World Heavyweight title gimmick match featuring Kane and The Undertaker, with Paul Bearer at ringside. He recently had turned against his longtime client to reunite with his deranged son. But this time, it'll be a buried alive match. Now, of course, you might be thinking, Fraser, you pretentious muppet. Kane vs. Taker in 2010 is like Metallica these days. While the performances evoke nostalgic feelings, all of their newer work lacks the breakneck speed and energy of what made them transcendent to begin with. To which I say, you couldn't be more wrong, because Kane and Undertaker never performed with much speed or energy in the first place, let's face it. For the WWE Championship match over on Raw, Randy Orton would defend against Nexus leader Wade Barrett, who has John Cena in his corner. See, Cena was forced to join the Nexus after losing to Barrett, and now has to follow Barrett's orders. This involves seconding Barrett and presumably helping him win the title. And Cena, of course, he was torn. Torn between his desire to only engage in fair play and his yearning to provoke Orton into continuing their best of 93 match pay-per-view series. But then there's the undercard, a match between the not yet goatee Daniel Bryan and the still fresh Dolph Ziggler. Layla was defending her Divas title against Natalia, and Goldust was against Ted DiBiase Jr. in the timeless and fondly remembered Your Dad Ruined My Dad's Life by stealing Sapphire away and then casting her into oblivion feud. Really, it was the Sammy and Kevin of his day. And, um, well, that just about covers it, really. Six scheduled matches, one of them with stakes. One of them, a retread of a 1998 feud. Another match, a legacy version of a 1990 feud. And a WWE title match with a guy in jorts at ringside is more important than the people in the actual title match. Some artists release compilation and B-side albums to fill contractual obligations. So if Neil Young were a wrestling promoter, I'd imagine Bragging Rights 2010 might look like landing on water. A total of 9,000 fans attended Bragging Rights at the Target Center in Minneapolis, but the timing proved much less beneficial for WWE, as at the same time as the pay-per-view, the hometown Minnesota Vikings were playing their rivals, Green Bay Packers, on Sunday Night Football, one of the last primetime games of Brett Favre's storied career playing against his old team. The Vikings vs Packers game did a whopping 26 million viewers on NBC, making it one of the most watched Sunday night games ever. But bragging rights by comparison 
did 137,000 buys, which was down 24% from the previous year's event. Good show or bad show, this was probably going to be the last bragging rights ever. A little fun fact though, AEW went on to run a pay-per-view, Full Gear 2021 for those of you interested, in the same building, drawing both a larger crowd and more buys. Brian Danielson, or Daniel Bryan at the time, was one of four men that wrestled on both shows, facing Miro on the latter. For bragging rights, Bryan faced a man that would eventually feud with Miro in one of the dumbest love triangles ever, Dolph Ziggler. Given both men's penchant for throwing their bodies here, there and everywhere in reckless fashion, this has potential to be awesome. And you know what? Props to them. It was. Brian and Zingler kicked the living bejesus out of each other across 16 unflinching minutes before Brian finally squeezed the rah rah spirit out of Nikki with his label lock. See, it's not rocket science at all. Brian versus Ziggler would have been at home on any modern era pay per view, setting the table for a promising night ahead. Perhaps I should say, most modern era pay per views. Next up, we get an unannounced segment featuring tag team champions Cody Rhodes and Drew McIntyre, which leads to. Hold on a second. <laughs> When were, when were Cody and Drew the tag team champions? Is that, that's a mistake in the script, right? When were Cody Rhodes and Drew McIntyre tag team champions? Send. <laughs> Apparently they were. Anyways, it seems it was Cody and Drew's month to be tag team champions, so they come out and complain that they've got no competition. So the anonymous GM, which we later learned to be Hornswoggle in maybe the the greatest F you pay off since the Sopranos final, gives them Nexus reps Cena and David Otunga as opponents. So the plot is simple. Cena is very strong, but David Otunga isn't. So the champs decimate him, but then Cena tags in and is like Popeye on spinach flavored bath salts. Basically, it's a six and a half minute match to give the kids some extra Cena so they don't feel ripped off. It's not like they're gonna change the belts or anything. Until they did change the belts after Cena submits Cody to his STF. Wait, Cena and Atunga were tag team champions? What? It's appropriate that on the night of Brett Favre's last major game, we get one of Ted DiBiase's last notable matches as well. Well, notable is a subjective term. It's Ted DiBiase post-legacy, a run that kinda went as follows. He brought his dad's belt back, he brought Virgil back, he traded in free breadsticks for Maurice and an ill-fitting theme song, he traded those in for a tailgater gimmick, and traded that in for no longer appearing on contemporary TV. It's a good thing he wasn't negotiating for Lisa's dental plan. Dental plan! Lisa needs braces. Dental plan! Lisa needs braces. Dental plan! Lisa needs braces. The angle for DiBiase and Goldust is that Goldust, who's managed by Axana for reasons that only a pre-2012 NXT viewer could possibly care about, has stolen the million dollar bell instead of doing the more sensible thing, which is buying a used replica off eBay and then wearing it to your school reunions. <sighs> You've got to let your fellow alumni know that you're a mid-carder but with upside. As for the match, well, well, it's a match. It's any seven and a half minute match that you could have seen on Superstars. Goldust looked good, DiBiase was his usual competent self, and what they produced was a glorified house show opener. And like a house show match, the heel wins with mild chicanery, though the babyface do get some measure of post-match revenge as they steal the belt again anyway, just to make the youngins in the crowd less sad. Your life isn't any worse for having seen this match, but it's not much better either. So let's browse the Observer archives real fast to see how Dave Melty Melts found the card so far rating wise. Brian and Ziggler got three and a half stars, Otunga and Cena versus Drew and Cody got one and a half, and DiBiase and Goldust got two. It looks like an undercard to say the least. I think he may have shortchanged Amdrag and Dolph a smidge, but otherwise pretty spot on. Fortunately, the more ambitious fare is still to come, so there's still time to turn this C show into a See, that wasn't so bad show. Next is a Divas title match between Layla and Natalia. It goes little more than five minutes. For those of you who complain about modern booking of women's wrestling, you may remember just how archaic things were in the Divas era, when TV matches were regularly just a minute long and felt like they only existed to fulfill some sort of federally mandated obligation to give the women's wrestlers some in-ring time. Unfortunately, this was that era. And with due respect to the participants, this was one of those matches. Layla and partner Michelle McCool deliver some pretty insipid pre-match spiel, which even Matt Stryker calls out for being bad. And bear in mind, this is a man that's done commentary with Vampiro. The match from there was pretty paint by numbers. Your typical cowardly heel versus valiant babyface encounter that ends with chicanery and interference. Layla wins to retain, and WWE is like, oh, 
Now that's out the way. Next up to complete their three match pay-per-view swillogy are Kane and The Undertaker for the World Heavyweight title in a Buried Alive match. Really an Undertaker Kane holy war without Jim Ross there to scream about brimstone and damnation is just not the same. It's kind of like the wrestling equivalent of doing 8 out of 10 cats does countdown but without Sean Locke. We begin the match with chants of we want blood during the height of the PG era and as funny as that was some things are just no laughing matter like this match. Certainly the crowd in Minneapolis treated the Buried Alive match like a funeral as they were somber and silent for most of it. Not that Undertaker and Kane gave them much more than a glacially paced brawl for most of its duration anyway. Now perhaps it wasn't as bad as Hogan Warrior 2 but it is a sharp decline from each man's prime years. After what feels like three hours of mind numbing brawling we get a truly random appearance from the Nexus who know a thing or two about being buried alive. For reasons never adequately explained the walk aloners into the unknowners help Kane bury his brother in the provided grave and and that well that was pretty much that fortunately the undertaker not only didn't die but he forgave kane long enough to fly to saudi arabia with him and team up in an even worse match i guess time and blood money really do heal all wounds so with two matches left to go, let's check out the updated scorecard from Uncle Dave. Brian vs Ziggler gets three and a half, Atunga and Cena vs Drew and Cody get one and a half, DiBiase and Goldust get two, Layla and Natalia get a quarter star, and Kane and Taker gets one. To this point, other than Brian and Ziggler using 16 minutes to have a match close to their standard, it feels like no thought has gone into bragging rights whatsoever. I mean, no thought has gone into bragging rights, but it's just starkly evident in the execution now, that's all. Speaking of bragging rights, we come to the titular match, which essentially feels like Survivor Series before Survivor Series, much in the same way that, for Americans, Thanksgiving has become like Christmas part one. And for those playing along at home, Punk, Zeke, Morrison, Miz, Truth, Santino and Sheamus represent Raw, while Alberto, Show, Edge, Ray, Kofi, Rex and Swagger represent SmackDown. And everyone is wearing their brand-centric t-shirts to strip them off their individuality, though they are still a step up from the way too on the nose property of WWE Performance Center digs that they, they get them wearing now. The winner doesn't get anything except for the smug satisfaction of knowing that they're the answer to a really hard trivia question that nobody could possibly know the answer to after like a couple months and nobody would ask that question. But they give the match time. 27 whole minutes in fact, though for a while the match was kind of a slog as wrestlers of different tiers engaged in wholly basic action over pointless stakes, there wasn't much of a sense of urgency and even when Smackdown lost three wrestlers in a row, nobody was palming their foreheads with both hands going whoa! The only real excitement was when Edge and Mysterio overcame the odds at the end, putting away Punk, Zeke and Miz, technically three former ECW superstars to win the, well, to win bragging rights. Look, how long did Edge and Ray like brag for after they won bragging rights? You didn't watch it either? Nah, Sam. So yeah, for a match that was supposed to be the purpose of this expensive standalone pay-per-view, the end result sure was forgotten quicker than the wildcard rule. But finally, we come to the main event, where Barrett with John Cena takes on Orton, who doesn't care for John Cena, for the WWE title, a belt often held by John Cena. John Cena will be at ringside, fresh off John Cena winning a tag team title with John Cena's new unexpected partner, who's actually a part of a plan to break John Cena's spirit. In fact, John Cena has to make sure his boss wins or John Cena will be fired. Question is, can John Cena keep his job while overcoming the odds to make John Cena more of a focal point than the two wrestlers inside the bloody ring that John Cena is standing adjacent to. Wait, who is in this match? So yeah, it's classic WWE making it about John Cena, even when he's not wrestling. Understandable because he's the one selling t-shirts in every Skittles color imaginable, but it was really annoying to watch if he preferred a variety in your wrestling shows. Cena's conflicted about screwing over Orton, a man that he's feuded with on and off again since 2007, and even once strangled with a handcuff chain, because that's the story they're telling today. Worse for Cena though, he has to watch Randy Orton vs Wade Barrett with a front row seat. It's not that Orton vs Barrett was horrendous or anything, it's just exceedingly basic, never leaving first gear during its 14 minute duration. Next to Brian, Barrett had the most upside of the original NXT 8, but in 2010 it hadn't manifested in his in-ring work. He's just a towering brawler with a prefab moveset he picked up working within WWE's system, while Orton usually works to the level of his opponents. In short, 
Orton vs Barrett had a lower ceiling to begin with. The only way it could be much worse is if the match had a BS finish that dared compel you to spend $40 on the ensuing pay-per-view. Guess what? The match ends in a DQ when Cena attacks Barrett. Thus, Barrett won the match, allowing Cena to keep his job, but the title doesn't change hands. And I know that sounds dumb, but really think about it. Think how smart John Cena is here. No other manager or a champion in WWE history ever thought to hit their client with a weapon as soon as the bell rang to save the title via DQ. Not Heenan, not Heyman, not Head. None of them. So much respect to Peacemaker here. Orton was so happy to still be the champion that he gave both Barrett and Cena RKOs after the match. Thanks for watching. Raw's on tomorrow. The NFL's for losers. And we have all your money. No refunds. And good night. So one last look at the asterisk list. And we have this. Brian versus Ziggler, three and a half stars. Otunga and Cena versus Drew and Cody, one and a half stars. DiBiase versus Goldust, two stars. Layla versus Natalia, just a quarter star. Kane versus Taker, one star. The Elimination Match, two and a quarter stars. And Orton versus Barrett, one and three quarter stars. So a thoroughly forgettable and mediocre pay-per-view. In the annual Wrestling Observer Newsletter Awards, readers voted it the third worst pay-per-view of 2010. It didn't win because TNA existed. And hardcore justice, your day is coming. WWE bragging rights wasn't even bad in the December to Dismember or 1995 King of the Ring car wreck way, where it's so atrocious that it becomes a generational touchstone of mockery. It's just bad in an extremely dull way where you, you can't comprehend that this and the annual Royal Rumble were the same price. Only two matches involved real long-term feuds and they didn't result in worthwhile action. The rest of the shows could have been relegated to the third or fourth SmackDown in any given month and nobody would have felt WWE was leaving money on the table. So it's no surprise that this was the final bragging rights pay-per-view as the concept was killed off. Piss poor metrics and the ending of the original brand split the following year were the causes of death. Of course, we'd have to put up with more hollow inter-brand warfare just a few years later, but WWE chose to host said warfare at the already existing Survivor Series. It's the only night of the year where it happens, you know? Really, to sum it all up, the biggest problem with WWE bragging rights is, well, there was nothing from this show particularly worth bragging about.